Plato. Her most recent book, uh, The Political Pod of Founding Feminist, um, she uh, sort of ends where many of us pick up the study of women's rights in the United States um, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Sojourner Truth. Um, so Lisa goes back uh, farther into the 19th century to think about the very careful theoretical work that uh, our founding feminists did in order to make the kind of activism possible, uh, both on behalf of women's suffrage and also on behalf of abolitionism in the 19th century. And her uh, more recent work is going to take a look at some late 19th century thinkers. And of course, this work is so important to expanding political and social rights even within the 20th century. So please join me in welcoming Lisa Pace better to see you. Without fear of reprisal. 
So are we in a constitutional crisis? What role does the Constitution play in guiding us going forward? As we know, constitutionalism means different things to different people. They are typically split into two camps. The originalists who, as the term itself suggests, interpret the Constitution by recreating or imagining the original political, social, and cultural context in which it was written. And in the other camp, the so-called living constitutionalists, who recognize that while certain constitutional principles have remained the same throughout time, others have changed because of the evolving political, social, and cultural context in which we live. So presumably for each of these camps, a constitutional crisis would mean different things. The originalists would believe that any significant departure from the historically contextualized document would constitute a betrayal of fundamental constitutional principles. The living constitutionalists would contend that any interpretation that was trapped in the past or failed to sufficiently accommodate change over time would pose a fundamental challenge to constitutional principles. Because the stakes are so high, each camp tends to view the other as an existential threat to the well-being of the nation. Originalists use the term living constitution derisively to delegitimize the claims of others who view the historically contextualized constitutional principles as tainted with racism, sexism, and elitism. The living constitutionalists see originalists as preservers and defenders of antiquated notions that promoted inequality and denied freedom and opportunities to marginalized and oppressed groups in America, in spite of their claims to the contrary. Two excellent examples to use in re-examining this divide are the early struggle for women's rights in America and the abolition of slavery. These constitute fundamental challenges to the American they pose fundamental questions about the Constitution. Is the expansion of women's rights and the abolition of slavery inherent in the Constitution? Can we simply expand <coughs> fundamental constitutional principles to accommodate women's rights and abolitionism? Are the expansion of women's rights and ab the abolition of slavery the logical conclusion of constitutional principles? Or is the Constitution fundamentally incomplete or flawed by failing to grant women's rights and abolish slavery outright? Were the expansion of women's rights the abolition of slavery the outgrowth of evolving political, social, and cultural circumstances that the Constitution needed to accommodate, in particular through amendment? Who is right? Is this divide permanent? Can it be bridged? There are no easy answers to those questions. However, I'd like to spend some time discussing how several 18th and 19th century women thought about the Constitution with the hope that they can help reframe this debate and provoke further discussion. Some of these women you probably already know about, others not. I want to show that they are all worth knowing and should be familiar. Indeed, I hope that they ultimately become an integral part of our understanding of American constitutions. As the subtitle of my lecture indicates, I will start by discussing the famous interchange between John and Abigail Adams in which Abigail pleaded with her husband to remember the ladies when the American Revolution ended and the newly emerged liberated nation proceeded to shape its laws. Let me read from her letter. I long to hear that you have declared an independency, and by the way in the new code of laws which I suppose it would be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. That your sex are naturally tyrannical is a truth so thoroughly established as to admit no dispute, but such of you as wish to be happy willingly give up the harsh title of master, the more tender and endearing one of friend. Why then not put it out of the power of the vicious and the lawless to use us with cruelty and indignity, with impunity? Men of sense in all ages abhor those customs which treat us as the vassals of your sex. 
Regard us then as beings placed by providence under your protection and an imitation of the Supreme Being. Make use of that power only for our happiness. John Adams' ultimate dismissal of his wife's concerns is humorous, but also disturbing. As to your extraordinary code of laws, I cannot but laugh. We have been told that our struggle has loosened the bands of government everywhere. That children and apprentices were disobedient. That schools and colleges were grown turbulent. <laughs> that Indians slighted their guardians and Negroes were insolent to their masters. Abigail Adams makes the obvious point that America would be hypocritical if it fought to liberate itself only to continue to oppress its women, <laughs> presumably by denying them the right to own and control property, make contractual agreements, and secure some level of legal protection, so that the mantra, no taxation without representation, did not apply to them. This legal representation may or may not include suffrage or the right to hold a political office. There is much speculation about this interchange and its significance. Is it simply an example of witty banter between spouses? Or did it mean something more to either or both? John Adams' delayed response concedes that men do not want to lose the precarious authority they currently enjoy. He also alludes to the upending of traditional hierarchies that would occur if women and other suppressed groups were given any authority. For her part, Abigail Adams continued to make her case to her friend, Mary Otis Warren which indicates that she was not satisfied with the response she received. Indeed, Adams asked Warren if she would join her in petitioning Congress for expanding laws for women, one of the most powerful protest tools used in the abolitionist and early, rights, and early women's rights movements. Among other things, petitions allowed women to sign their own names, and in doing so, assert their own existence as an individual, something they were unable to do in so many ways. It might seem strange to begin a discussion of constitutionalism with an interchange that took place years before the Constitution was ever written. But clearly, the Revolution, and especially the Declaration of Independence, played an important role in the creation of the Constitution. And it played a very important role in these women's ideas. Indeed, the litmus test for the Constitution, both formal and informal, for many reformers, was the extent to which the fundamental principles of the Declaration were upheld. If the divergence between the Declaration and the Constitution were too wide, change was necessary. The struggle for expanding women's rights and ending slavery were, for many reformers, primary examples of such a law. If we apply the theories of constitutionalism <coughs> to the Adams Exchange, we can see the roots of the arguments subsequent reformers will pursue. That's why I started with them. For Abigail Adams, the expansion of women's rights is the logical extension of the principles that drove the American Revolution and helped shape the Constitution. How could John Adams not see that? Although Adams' position is radical, her argument resembles the originalist position. John Adams' approach is complex, depending on your interpretation. At times, Adams seems to concede his wife's point that women's rights would make sense in this context. However, he expresses strong resistance to such an, and such an unorthodox idea as if it were an unwanted foreign imposition. Women's rights, and with it abolitionism, as Adam's reference to insolent Negroes suggests, would destroy the very order and rule of law that the Constitution is seem to secure. Remember the Ladies reflects a larger trend in these reform movements, in which seemingly radical ideas are couched in terms of marriage. I argue that this is not merely a rhetorical device to help legitimize what would otherwise seem deeply objectionable in the eyes of the public. We can't read anyone's minds, of course, but it seems that there is a great conviction on the part of these reformers that their cause is deeply consistent with American principles. It is helpful to see this, I believe, because it blurs the seemingly sharp distinction between originalists and living constitutions. It raises important questions about these categories themselves. It makes us think about what constitutionalism really means for ourselves as individuals and for our country as a whole. The familiar arguments may no longer neatly apply. 
we may have to come up with things. I want to jump ahead a bit in time to talk about some of the women I've written about in my book, The Political Thought of America's Home. No, I just can't hear it. Francis Wright, an important and yet neglected 19th century Scottish commentator on America, was an early supporter of the American culture. With her gradual recognition of the deep entrenchment of inequality in American society came deep disillusionment. Slavery and the oppression of women were not merely fading remnants of British aristocracy, as her original optimism led her to believe, nor was American economic development guided by the common good. Instead, she increasingly focused her energies on exposing the systemic and inter interrelated causes of inequality that plagued the new republic and on developing a comprehensive plan for reform. The key component is government-sponsored universal education that will be funded through progressive taxation. Inspired by socialist reformers such as Robert Owen, Wright envisioned a cooperative effort to mitigate inequalities of race, sex, and class. Wright repeatedly invokes the Declaration's famous claim that all men are created equal as the basis of American society that all other countries should imitate. For Wright, quote, the great principles stamped in America's Declaration of Independence are true, are great, are sublime, and are all open. American government is unique in that its constitution possesses the principle of improvement, namely the power of silent adaptation to the altering views of the governing and the governed people. The key to this principle is representation. Thus, although Wright believes that America's constitution constitutional principles are adaptable or living, they are also fixed by the idea of human improvement and line with liberty and equality. Wright concludes that it is for <coughs> Americans to examine their institutions because they have the means of improving them to examine their laws, because uh, at will they can alter them. It is for them not to rest satisfied with words who can seize upon things, and to remember that equality means not the mere equality of political rights, however valuable, but the equality of instruction and the equality of virtue. And that liberty means not the mere voting of elections, but the free and fearless exercise of the mental faculties and that self-possession which springs out of well-reasoned opinions and consistent practice. And only by adopting universal education and other reforms that she proposes can Americans actualize the ideals on which their system of representation is based, so that, quote, the people are enlightened judges of their own interests, or in other words, that they are by nature or by education fitted to distinguish the means for which the greatest happiness may be produced to the whole population, and that the representatives through whom the people legislate okay. shall, in all cases, faithfully carry into effect the views of the people whose attorneys they are. Wright's position combines originalist and living constitutionalist perspectives. It is originalist in that she agrees on a set of fundamental principles in the Declaration, yet these principles, principles must also adapt, not simply to changing times, but specifically to improvements in education, wisdom, and knowledge. The linchpin to the system for Wright is human self-development. Without it, the system collapses. I've alluded to the connection between the abolitionist and early women's rights movements. Although there is considerable overlap, many women's rights advocates were also abolitionists and vice versa. They were not simply the same. There were many, there were as many who supported one but not the other. But the next woman I would like to discuss, Lucretia Mott, was a supporter of both. That this diminutive, plain spoken woman could have said to have had an understanding of constitutionalism might be surprising and perhaps even implausible. But a closer look at her views on the matter reveals important insights about a particularly acrimonious period in American constitutional history and about constitutionalism generally. The emergence of William Lloyd Garrison as a leader in the abolitionist movement signaled a direct attack on the Constitution declaring the Constitution a pro-slavery document because it did not fully abolish slavery and included the infamous three-fifths clause. In fact, Garrison actually burned a copy of the Constitution. 
along with the Fugitive Slave Act. He was also known for his no government stance, relying on moral suasion rather than political action to abolish slavery. Frederick Douglass would ultimately part ways with Garrison over his aversion to politics and his view of the Constitution as hopelessly corrupt. Mott was a Hicksite Quaker named for its founder, Elias Hicks, a traveling Quaker preacher whose powerful critique of established doctrine led to the 1827 split in the Society of Friends. Hicks opposed what he perceived as an over-reliance by worshippers on the scriptural interpretations of Quaker elites and an undue reverence for the written word at the expense of good works. Instead, Hicks sought to reassert the importance of direct individual encounters with scriptural teachings and the necessity of actively applying principles embodied in the life and works of Jesus to everyday life. Hicks also strove to reestablish the prominence of the inner light in Quaker practice, a kind of internal voice possessed by all human beings, regardless of religious persuasion, which nevertheless provides a direct connection to the divine through active discernment. The Hicksite understanding required active engagement and reasoning, not passive obedience to the word of God. Mott's encounter with Hicks help explain, uh, helps explain the origins of her own systematic attack on ideology, doctrine, and dogma, and her insistence on independent reflection and free thinking. For Mott, natural rights and the equality of individuals ultimately originate from the Hicksite Quaker view of human beings as creations of God who are guided by the inner light and committed to active discernment. Mott understands the individual holistically, created by a non-sectarian God to engage in reflective action and thereby honor her duties and obligations to others. Human beings must take active responsibility for discerning the inner light and constructing a world that allows all people to function as human beings. As an extension of her progressive faith, Mott fought for women's rights and abolitionism throughout her life. She played a prominent role at the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention for Women's Rights, and she founded and actively participated in the longest lasting interracial abolitionist organization in the United States, the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, among many, many other accomplishments. I must say, we also should have seen those today. Mott is often counted among the Garrisonian abolitionists who agreed with his condemnation of the Constitution and his deep skepticism about politics. Although she did echo many of Garrison's views, she did not simply accept them as for him. It is not anarchy that Mott advocates, I would argue, but rather a radical form of democracy, which in turn informs her constitutionalism. In her 1849 speech, Discourse on Woman, Mott articulates an understanding of superior law that is not only informed by God, but also developed through the transformative process of self-reflection and self-examination her anti-dogmatism requires. This law requires direct and indirect political participation by women and men alike. Women should be given the right to vote, even if the government is corrupt. Far be it from me to encourage women to vote, she explains, or to take an active part in politics in the present state of our government, namely, one that relies on violence and coercion to enforce its laws. However, a woman's right to elect a franchise is the same and should be yielded to her whether she exercised that right or not. For what, women must have a say in the laws they are asked to obey, whether by voting or serving in political office. This is where her constitution is. She continues, quote, when in the diffusion of light and intelligence, a convention, not only a <coughs> constitutional convention, shall be called to make regulations for self-government on Christian non-resistant principles, I can see no good reason why women should not participate in such an assemblage, taking part equally with women. Mott speculates, who knows, but that if women act in her part in governmental affairs, there might be an entire change in the turmoil of political life. And if a woman's judgment were exercised, why might she not aid in making laws by which she is governed? Mott is vague about the structure and implementation of such a gathering, 
Nevertheless, she does not turn away from political involvement for women, but rather expands it. Watt's constitutionalism is clearly living, and that she is proposing a kind of a new beginning that includes men and women living upright lives. Yet she also resembles an originalist in that she is contemplating how the Constitution should have been created in the first place, as it was originally intended. Mott does not necessarily believe she is opposing something that isn't there in the first place. In her view, she is simply living up to the original intentions of the document and the process leading to its creation. I want to shift now to some better known 19th century women and examine their theories of constitutions. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is often referred to as the philosopher of the early women's rights movement. Stanton's pioneering efforts to collectivize women as a gender class transformed American law. Her work was integral to bringing about the formal constitutional recognition of women as enfranchised citizens who deserve full legal protection. And she presided over what perhaps most closely resembles a constitutional crisis facing the early women's rights movement. It came about after the Civil War when the so-called Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution were proposed. Whereas the 13th Amendment was largely welcome to the Welsh slavery, the 14th Amendment was contentious because it inserted the word nail into the Constitution for the first time when it determined that the right to vote by male inhabitants of the state who were 21 years of age should not be infringed. Stanton complained that if the amendment succeeded in inserting the word male to specify a citizen who is eligible to vote, it would take a century to remove it, to remove it and replace it with a definition that included women. Given the delay in the passage of the 19th Amendment, her concern proved urgent. Stanton and Susan B. Anthony also opposed the 15th Amendment, in spite of the fact that it would guarantee that the right to vote would not be deprived because of race. Stanton and Anthony were incensed that the amendment failed to ensure that voting would also not be denied because of sex. Stanton and Anthony's position was not universally accepted by women. Lucy Stone and others favored passage of the amendment primarily because it represented a partial yet significant victory and the battle for universal suffrage. They were convinced that the struggle for women's suffrage will be most successful at the state level, and they were determined to continue their gradual approach. By contrast, Stanton and Anthony wanted guarantees at the federal level that voting was a right to be protected for all. Stanton and Anthony's constitutionalism is fairly clear. The extension of full rights of citizenship to women is a logical extension of the original intent of the Constitution, writ large and small, and these rights should be guaranteed at the federal level. After all, after the Revolution, New Jersey's state constitution explicitly permitted women who owned property to vote until 1807, when restrictions were imposed. And as the Reconstruction Amendments were debated and passed, Wyoming, Utah, and other Western states began to extend women the right to vote. And yet, as is often the case, opponents of women's suffrage saw these efforts as an imposition on the original intention of the framers who did not envision women as voting citizens, but perhaps instead as vital help needs for voting men. Amendments generally appeared to be corrections to the original document, added on as circumstances change and need requires. However, much of their justification relies on the idea that the amendments are fully consistent with the original intent of the Constitution. And yet, Stanton's work has also been widely criticized for the polarizing elitism and racism that for many compromised her credibility. She was notorious for elevating the concerns of educated white women like herself by disparaging uneducated men of various races and ethnicities and by failing to explicitly and consistently advocate for black women. Stanton mocked the hypocrisy of the white male American ruling elite who vociferously opposed the enfranchisement of educated white women while allowing white immigrant and free black men to vote. The following quote from her well-known 1854 address to the legislature of New York sums up her views. We have every qualification required by the, the Constitution necessary to the legal voter but the one of sex. We are moral, virtuous, and intelligent, 
and in all respects quite equal to the proud white man himself. And yet by your laws, we are classed with idiots, lunatics, and neighbors. And though we do not feel honored by the place assigned us, yet, in fact, our legal position is lower than that of a higher one. For the Negro can be raised to the dignity of a voter who possess himself of $250. The lunatic can vote in his moments of sanity. And the idiot, too, if he be a male one, and not more than nine-tenths of him. Although Stanton's bigotry is undeniable, she also advocates for black women. In her impassioned 1865 letter entitled, This is, a, this is the Negro's Hour, Stanton points out that the enfranchisement of free black men and four women of either race affects black women directly, explaining that, quote, if the two millions of Southern black women are not to be secured in their rights of person, property, wages, and children, their emancipation is another form of slavery. Stanton reinforces the point that she is ultimately arguing for universal emancipation for all men and women, black and white, by declaring that, quote, in changing the status of the four millions of Africans, the women as well as the men should be secured in all the rights, privileges, and immunities of citizens. Tensions built over the proposed amendments. In 1867, when Kansas proposed two referenda, one on free black male suffrage, the other on women's suffrage, Lucy Stone, Stanton, and Anthony and others went to Kansas and lobbied aggressively for the measures. Antagonism increased when Stanton and Anthony accepted help from the notorious racist George Francis Tryon. After both referenda failed, recriminations ensued, with Stone blaming Stanton and Anthony for undermining the cause by attracting unneeded controversy and Stanton and Anthony questioning Stone's commitment to women's rights. Tensions came to a head in 1869 at the annual meeting of the American Equal Rights Association. Stanton had written an editorial opposing the 15th Amendment. Were it to pass anyway, she proposed a 16th Amendment that specifically granted women the vote. After this meeting, the women's rights movement split into two groups. One led by Stone that supported the amendment and favored the state by state approach to women's suffrage. The other group, led by Stanton and Anthony, formed their own organization, the National Women's Suffrage Association, and continued their opposition to the amendment and maintained their support for universal suffrage. Frederick Douglass attended this conference, and I would like to quote from the famous interchange between him and Anthony to give you a full sense of the divide. Douglas says, there is no name greater than that of Elizabeth Hay Stanton in the matter of women's rights and equal rights, but my sentiments are tinged a little against the revolution, the uh, newspaper that she published this in. There was in the address to which I allude the employment of certain names, such as Samuel and the Garden and the Bootla and the daughters of Jefferson and Washington, and all the rest that I cannot coincide with. I have asked what difference there is between the daughters of Jefferson and Washington and other daughters. I must say that I do not see how anyone can pretend that there is the same urgency in giving the ballot to women as to the Negro. With us, the matter is a question of life and death, at least in 15 states of the Union. When women, because they are women, are hunted down through the cities of New York and New Orleans, when they are dragged from their houses and hung upon, upon their posts, when their children are torn from their arms and their brains dashed out upon the pavement, when they are objects of insult and outrage at every turn, when they are in danger of having their homes burnt down under their heads, when their children are not allowed to enter schools, then they will have an urgency to obtain a ballot to their home. Thus, for Douglas, who continued to support women's suffrage throughout his life, African Americans face more immediate danger from disenfranchisement than do their white female counterparts. As a result, they need the vote first to protect themselves. And although Stanton and Anthony continually called for universal suffrage, their racist and elitist arguments often undermine the credibility of their claims. Even Douglas betrayed the limitations of his own ideas when asked whether the immediate need for suffrage was also true about black women. Douglas agreed, but not because she is a woman, but because she is black. For African-American feminists, 
Douglas's remarks signify his limited understanding of the unique challenges facing African American women because of their multiple identities. His views do not accommodate intersectionality, which seeks to account for the diversity of women within intersecting identities of sex and gender, race and ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. African American women do not face the same exact challenges as do African American men. They still suffer oppression at the hands of African American men, as Sojourner Truth's various remarks attest. Indeed, Truth claimed that if black men were granted the vote before black women, they would simply dominate women in the same way my white masters dominated them. Stepping back from the fray, what can we learn about the constitutional theories at work here? Douglas is a favorite among originalists because of his deep and abiding faith in the Constitution to provide a political solution to the problem of slavery. He believed in reform, not revolution, in accordance with the fundamental principles of the American project. So for him, uh, suffrage and the full rights of citizenship are a continuation of family principles, not a correction or addition to them. And yet, make no mistake, he was calling for the same sort of fundamental change that many abolitionists and women's rights advocates were calling for. And with respect to Stanton's constitutionalism, perhaps we can look at it from another angle. Her claims to universal suffrage are laced with racism and elitism. Does this mean that the claims themselves are fundamentally tainted as well? If she sees them as originating from the true intent of the Constitution, does this also mean that the true intent of the Constitution is also corrupt? Stan's perspective is the same as the elite white men who wrote the Constitution and are seeking to preserve their own privileges. Or is Stanton adding racism and elitism where it was done to begin with? Is she tainting the original principles for the I'm still grappling with these questions myself, so I have no easy answers. A final aspect of constitutionalism in the early women's rights movement that I would like to mention but merits much further attention is the approach championed by radical reformer Victoria Woodhull, who in 1872 unsuccessfully ran for president of the United States. Whereas Stanton appreciated and celebrated Woodhull's free thinking and controversial views, she advocated free love, among other things, a long list, uh, Susan B. Anthony saw them as a danger to the movement. Among Woodhull's many contributions was the new departure, an innovative interpretation of the 14th and 15th Amendments. Although the 14th specifically refers to men, the first clause mentions citizens as a whole all persons, which for Whittle must include all women. Because the federal government conferred federal citizenship, the federal government was also be responsible for, for, for protecting the privileges of the people. Because these privileges were not spelled out, the government extrapolates them. They rely on the will of the people, and therefore necessarily must include suffrage. The 15th Amendment's reference to race also includes everyone of all races according to Woodhull's interpretation. So Woodhull's constitutionalism, uh, so federal government, uh, the federal government must protect women and men from voting discrimination. Woodhull's constitutionalism, like many of the examples I've discussed today, pose some thought-provoking questions about originalist and revisionist interpretation. Again, the familiar dis uh, distinctions seem to be there. So to conclude, I would like to briefly discuss three 19th century African American women who I have just begun to study for my next research project and who raise important constitutional questions that we have only begun to appreciate. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Anna Julia Cooper, and Ida B. Wells. These women come from a particularly bleak period in American constitutional history when the lofty promises of enfranchisement and liberty made after the Civil War were cruelly betrayed as Jim Crow emerged and oppression persisted. The yawning gap between constitutional principles and political practices stubbornly persisted throughout the 19th century and as we know beyond. I'll start with Harper, a native of Baltimore, like myself, who was a poet, novelist, journalist, and activist. Although she participated in several important women's rights conventions, including the pivotal 1866 meeting, where she delivered perhaps her best-known speech, We Are All Bound Up Together, 
Harper is not honored, even today. She often harshly criticized white women advocates such as Stanley Anthony and later Francis Ford. Perhaps unsurprising, Harper was not included in Stanton's history of women's suffrage. Instead, Stanton focuses on social truth, whose narrative Stanton shapes for her purposes. Although Harper is often classified as part of the other side with Stone and Douglas, who supported the 15th Amendment, this is a simplification of her views on the complex subject. African American women like Harper were placed in an impossible situation to side with Douglas and others who do not fully appreciate the unique challenges facing African American women, or side with Stanton and Anthony with their racist and elitist views. White women created this divide, incidentally, not African American women. So this makes this model perhaps ill suited to interpret Harper and others. I would argue that Harper's contribution to constitutionalism is to offer important lessons in deliberative democracy. How can we even begin to interpret the Constitution if we do not have the tools we wish to do it? Harper's instruction in deliberative democracy is evident through her rhetoric in the 1866 speech, in which she continually seeks to simultaneously unite and divide her audience, calling attention to their similarities as well as their often irreducible differences, so as to facilitate a kind of habit of thinking and presumably acting that seeks to maintain a kind of flexible, adaptable unity while honoring diversity and the integrity of every individual. In this world, white women would not presume to speak for all black women, thereby silencing them, however paradoxically. And yet all women, black and white, recognize their common plight as they fight against discrimination and oppression of all sorts. Clearly, her ideas pose important questions about originalist and revisionist interpretations of the Constitution. The second African American woman I would like to discuss very briefly is Anna Julia Cooper, the fourth African American woman to earn a PhD. Yet her influence is unappreciated. In spite of her deep understanding of racial and sexist oppression, she is eclipsed by her better known male contemporaries W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, Alexander Cole, and others. Indeed, one of her major works, <coughs> Voice from the South, predates many of their contributions. Du Bois famously quotes from Harper by from Cooper's Voice from the South in his essay, The Damnation of Women, without attributing the passage to Cooper. Her expansive and wide-ranging work defies the easy categorization and merits further attention. The ways in which she sought to integrate women into the elite African-American community of scholars and preachers, which itself was dominated by men, poses additional questions about how to incorporate marginalized individuals into mainstream institutions. The third and final woman I would like to mention, again very briefly, is Ida B. Wells, the fearless chronicler of lynchings in the United States, who was recently honored at last in the New York Times overlooked series of obituaries of influential people who were not memorialized at the time of their death. Incidentally, many of these people and she has been honored at the new National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. Clearly, any deliberative democracy needs its gadflies, its recorders of ugly truths. Wells gives voice to the silenced victims of racial violence by weaving together accounts from media sources from all over the country into a narrative that is purely her own making. Clearly, our understanding of constitutionalism requires an accurate foundation in the facts. We need to make informed judgments. To deny the horrors of our past would be deeply unjust. To what extent are Wells' efforts originalists, originalist, or revisionist in spirit? Does her approach pose such a radical departure as scholars typically think? I hope that my presentation has helped lay the groundwork for further discussion about what our Constitution means, how it should be interpreted now, and in the as seen through the lens of several remarkable individuals in American history, some familiar, some not. I want to be clear. These are only a few, many more women we should study in the 
Some will lend themselves to theoretical examination and the wisdom than others. In many cases, we will have to reconsider what, con what constitutes theorizing itself, i.e., who qualifies as a theorist. Does theorizing require writing lengthy treatise treatises? Or can we look at letters, speeches, and other informal modes of communication? How many rich sources of information remain to be discovered in obscure archives and atmosphere? Instead of seeing pragmatic politics and political theory as mutually antagonistic as we often do, should they be considered complementary? What new analytical tools do we need to devise a, and to devise to gain a better understanding? What old tools need to be dusted off and polished up to be useful? These are important questions to consider on Constitution Day 2018. Thank you very much. Um, and this whole idea 
idea of, you know, on one hand, being um, imbued with the stand light, you know, as a university principal, um, and being the foundation of, of her view of the equivalent of the equivalent of the rights, um, and really having the religious foundation, but also um, relying on reason and discernment and discussion and deliberation um, to, to make sense of it. Right? So not just being on the response. It's your responsibility as a preacher of God who is men and women of the community um, to discern that to the best of your ability. And that's what it meant to be a woman of the right person. And just imagine what the world would look like if we had a few more of those folks. You know, she wanted to create that was equally important not just for individuals to pursue that way of life, but also to create a community that would allow people. So that's where it's a very democratic people are you know, deliberating together. Um, they are you know, thinking on their own, sharing their ideas with others, um, sharing authority. That was another really important issue for her. And the issue of non resistance um, that doesn't get enough attention, I think, uh, in Vermont. Um, she was a, 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 a peace advocate. It's not just pacifism in terms of not fighting the war or the military. It's really just a whole approach to life where people should be involved because they want to, not because they're forced to. And they want to uh, follow those laws because they are persuaded by them and they agree to it. And that's what, that's what it's supposed to be about. So she, the whole idea of forcing people to do things that they don't understand and that are against the law um, is a huge problem. Whatever political decisions uh, comes from that are aren't just you can post something on someone that you don't understand. That's why. Yes. Um, how do you think the stories of these women can avoid the pain of a lot of times? Well, as you've been listening, what kind of things are you listening to? Right. How do you um, what do you mean? I guess I mean maybe just picking up on what I was just saying about. Um, the idea that um, could you speak up a little louder? Oh, really? Okay, because yeah. I can hear it. Boy, I can hear it. I'm trying to get it. We can. Okay, <laughs> this is room is amazing. Yeah. Like, I'm hearing myself from behind myself. <laughs> um, so someone like the creature mock, you know, just what I said about the whole wall. As soon as you think of a wall, you're thinking, oh, something that's going to tell me something that I may, maybe want to do but shouldn't do, and I'm going to be forced to you know, do something. Um, and that's what it means. The wall is coercion. Um, her view of it is completely the opposite. The wall is persuasion. There's a huge difference between those things. You know, it's one thing to say, well, you know, I don't like what's going on in Washington. And you're, you're passing all these laws that I don't like and I don't want to follow. It's another thing to say, okay, you know, uh, they're passing these laws. I need to understand them and be persuaded <laughs> that they are worth obeying. How much of a difference would that make? I mean, and that doesn't even get into partisan stuff going on. You know, that can apply to everyone. So that would be a big game changer. You know, just as a small example. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but that's, that's one that came to me in the mind. Yes? The, the women that you mentioned, do you consider them to be part of this key tradition in feminism in America or like of American political thought? Like, how do you classify? Well, how are you distinguishing between American political thought and feminism? Well, I think, like, when we think about American political thought, when we think of, like, male political theorists, so I'm saying, do you consider these women, like, they've been elected, they're as great as, like, Jefferson and Hamilton, and we ought to consider them, and you consider them, like, strictly within like, this deep like, tradition of feminism in America, like, what we're talking about? Um, that's the approach that I took in my book. Um, and it's the approach that, you know, I may, I'm trying to make the case though, okay, I'm trying, I am trying to persuade, because the case needs to be made, you have to, you know, explain their arguments and show why, you know, they are, you know, they merit that kind of examination, um, and I guess, well, I'm used to that level, um, although that level, you know, there's some problems with some of those folks, right, um, you know, you mentioned Jefferson, who's a complex person. <laughs> right, understand your um, So, you know, they're not perfect. And, you know, so 
So their theories are better than others. Um, but that's, you know, the, some of the questions that I posed at the end of, of my talk, <coughs> we have to ask ourselves, what is a theorist? What do you have to do to qualify? You know, um, if we use that in the 19th century, and even with the founders, you can't use either PhD in science and specialty code of thought, because that didn't really exist. Um, you didn't have to be a professor. Um, there were very few of them because there were very few, still very few universities. And women, by the way, were not allowed to go to the university or college until the 19th century. Um, and even so, there were very small numbers of women um, attending uh, university or college, and they weren't the self taught. Um, so they didn't have formal education, many of them. Um, they did not have the opportunity or the desire to write these. Treatise on human nature. But I have you know, time to spend you know, writing <coughs> pages and pages. And having an audience for that. There was no built in audience for these women. I mean, they talked to each other. Um, and there were, obviously, you know, I don't want to over, uh, overstate this. There were important women writers who were very influential. Um, and they merit further study as well. I'm just, I'm really looking at um, you know, people who are not on the radar screen. Um, and trying to make the case that really I mean, we should be. And not necessarily that everybody is equally important or compelling or significant, but I think they all have something important to contribute. And it's our uh, obligation to at least try to figure out what that is before we come to judgments about you know, whether, whether they are uh, worthy or not uh, of the title. But I can tell you, I mean, I've um, actually, uh, you know, political theorists do very little, uh, or typically do very little archival research, for example. We just have a library of big fat books, you know, that we have to move from place to place every time we get a job, so we can cross the region. Um, so that's, that's our data base, right? Um, for these women, those books don't really exist. They didn't publish books. They didn't write treatises like that. So we have to go to things like their letters or speeches that may or may not have been published, or you know, stories about their speeches in newspapers. So there's a lot of digging around um, that you wouldn't have to do for you know, mainstream canonical thinkers. And then to interpret them, what tools to use. So it's, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, yeah, again, I'm trying to make the case that um, you know, there are things going on that also uh, shed important light into some of the sort of crisis moments in our history that in some ways are well understood, but in other ways poorly understood. Yes. So in the beginning of your lecture, you talked about sort of the interface of uh, originalism and the living constitutionalism ideas. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you think that these uh, women theorists, we'll call them theorists, fit into, like, are they applicable to the modern judicial system in the sense that they sort of show that these ideas are not that different and you apply them in that way? Or are they more applicable to this modern moment in like showing that there is more feminism in our history than we formerly thought there was? So I'm sort of curious as to what, where you think that uh, part of the thesis fits into like, the modern moment. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think actually both of those things are true of my understanding um, that, you know, as I, as I said, I think the distinctions uh, between those two groups, I mean, I, and I am creating a, you know, sort of cartoonish, simplistic, um, you know, um, grouping here, but it's for the sake of making a overall argument. And I do think that, and especially, if, you know, we're watching, you know, the news and we have a Supreme Court um, that we consider as we speak, um, all of, you know, what's happening right now. Um, you know, it's, it, all of these things are very relevant, and you hear people, and you have people on TV representing these perspectives as, you know, labels, you know, and you just want to show them how they And, you know, and you don't know if you want to have all of them in the same panel at the same time these days. Um, so I think, you know, first of all, I think those, um, those distinctions are, you know, I think they're overblown. And, you know, one reason I think that's important to see is that we have a very polarized society right now. Um, but I also think that in many ways we might overstate the extent to which we are polarized. That we might have more in common than we think. Um, and the whole issue of legitimacy, right? What kinds of arguments do you marshal and put forth? 
to legitimize what you're trying to do and you know, what you're trying to decide. Um, the reason these kinds of debates are so important is because you know, we have people making all sorts of ideas on how to change things and do things differently. But the reason people should go along with that and it's okay is because it's legitimate. And it's legitimate because either it's a part of our fundamental tradition and we're just continuing what we're supposed to be doing anyway, or it's legitimate because I'm breaking the past and forging something new because the past is just the past. And, you know, um, those ideas are very deeply fall. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm really moved to move on, you know, some critical theory folks who really see that that a clear period is needed uh, from those family principles. Does that help a little bit? Or, and yeah, I mean, American feminism is, I mean, yeah, I started John A. I Adams. I think that's, you know, it's not exactly where it started, but boy, it's, it's early, right? Um, and they're not the only ones. Um, you know, there were a lot of other folks who wrote really interesting and important things and had ideas that you know, should, should be better known. Um, it's a part, it's, it's in the fabric. Thank you. 